Hamilton Police, the coroner, and the Ministry of Corrections are investigating another death at the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center. The, the third week of February 2015 was a very bad one for fatalities in Ontario jails, and nowhere more so than in Hamilton. Over the last couple of years, four inmates died inside the Barton Street Jail. An inquest is expected to be held into those deaths. To us, that latest death was especially shocking because the inmate found dead in his cell was 44-year-old Stephen Neeson, whose name and criminal past have featured prominently in the files of the Fifth Estate for almost a decade. We began following Stephen Neeson in 2006 at the maximum security Kingston Penitentiary for a story we were researching about repeat offenders trying to go straight and why so many of them can't. When we learned he had died, it seemed a unique opportunity to answer the question we began asking 10 years before. Then in his mid-30s, Neeson had spent almost his entire adult life robbing banks or behind bars because of it. For him, it seemed applying for parole was a large leap of faith. I always think that they're not gonna give it to me, and if they do, then it's a bonus, then you're not let down. You know, it's hard to get a parole out of a maximum security. Okay, so we'll begin. Today's the 22nd of November, 2006, and we're here at Kingston Penitentiary to see Stephen Neeson. We had been given permission to record his parole process, a rare chance to try to understand how a career criminal got here and what it would take for him to get out okay. and stay there. The parole board asked the same thing. My understanding is that there were some issues from your childhood and um, you were in and out of facilities and that kind of thing. Uh, what, what uh, in your mind caused you to sort of start acting up as, I guess by nine or ten years old you were starting to act up? I, what do you I, think is central? When I found out I was adopted, mm -hmm. uh, I never felt like I belonged. I mm -hmm. started to run away from home. And uh, when I was running away from home, I stole to eat and so on and so forth. And uh, it turned to, from surviving to crime. Then what may be the parole board's most common question. Uh, when did you get into drugs? When I was 18. What's your drugs of preference? Well, it was cocaine. Yeah. After that candid interview, waiting with his lawyer for the board's decision, Neeson sounded optimistic. Do you feel good about uh, the, the hearing? Yeah, yeah. I, think I thought it went. I, I, I thought it went better than what I expected it to. Actually. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but afterwards, yeah. with his birth mother Dale Lou back in touch and here for support, he didn't seem confident. No, it's okay. Huh? It's okay. I think you did fine. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy, especially since you don't. You've never gone. Parole. I'll see you upstairs then. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay. Cross my fingers. All right, Mom. Okay. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. By this point in his life, Stephen Neeson may have learned to expect the worst. His childhood photos appear normal. Baby pictures, school portraits, posing with new hockey skates. But Neeson's early years were troubled given up for adoption at birth, a hyperactive child sent to foster care, then psychiatric treatment and group homes. If blaming his adult life on a bad childhood sounds like a sob story, a leading forensic psychiatrist says it could well be the case. Well, the conventional wisdom is that somebody has a family that's deprived of love and affection, puts them at risk to become personality disordered. Um, Dr. John Bradford should know. He's examined many of Canada's most hardened criminals. We asked him to review Stephen Neeson's background. Um, so by the time he's 16 or 17, he's had multiple placements. He's even been in a psychiatric facility at a certain point. Um, so all of that leaves its scar on the person's personality and emotional health. By the time Neeson was 18, his rap sheet already showed a lot of scars three years in prison for property crimes and drug charges, a nine-year sentence for 10 bank robberies, 20 years more for robbing another 11 banks, the last one in his hometown of Brockville, Ontario, when he handed the teller a note saying he had a gun and demanding cash. 
Even after the trauma of a major crime, bank staff described a soft-spoken bandit with nice eyes. His notes may have had swear words or profanity in them, but he was polite to the people, and, and some people started to call him the gentleman robber. That's, you know, how everybody kind of puts a, uh, a spin on things. Brockville Police Detective Scott Fraser eventually would arrest Neeson. Charming, perhaps, but not meticulous in planning. Fraser says he used the same note he had to rob other local banks. So right away, he becomes number one in our suspect uh, pool because he's using the same lingo and same wording on the note. That arrest would put Stephen Neeson back behind bars at the Kingston Pen. He was only partway through his 20-year sentence when he applied for parole in 2006, and we first met him. Okay, ready? Mr. Neeson, um, I'll cover you to the chase. The board's not granting release today. Uh, Perhaps not surprisingly, the news that day wasn't good. The parole board wanted to know what we did. Why couldn't Neeson succeed in going straight? We're still really unclear as to why you made some of the decisions you made, why it is you have the record you have, and why it is for a smart guy who understands the stakes, you, you continue to, to make some of the same mistakes. Um, so there's still more work to do be done, obviously. It's not hopeless at all. So we wish you luck, and uh, that's the end of the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Afterwards, Stephen Neeson promised he'd take their suggestions to heart. Uh, I'm going to take the advice that they've offered and uh, start seeing a psychologist and uh, see if I can get this substance abuse program under my belt. So fast forward about 10 years after that parole hearing. For all of his promises and the parole board's good wishes, what happened to Stephen Neeson since? Well, by 44, he'd spent the better part of the past quarter century behind bars. His time on the outside, often measured in months, in relationships and jobs that didn't last, in drug abuse, and inevitably, it seemed, in returns to prison. He had good opportunity. Mm -hmm. His mother, Dale Lou, was just 15 when she had him. After his adoption as a baby, she had no idea what happened to her child until reunited when Stephen was in his 30s. In the dozen years since they found each other again, she says she's only spent one day with her son when he wasn't behind prison walls and razor wire. It was his comfort zone. He was the big fish in a little pond, right? I, I think he was comfortable there because he knew what to expect and it wasn't the big scary world where you had to prove, he'd already learned to prove himself there. He learned to protect himself there. But she insists there was reason to hope for so much more, to believe he ultimately could find the inner strength to break that vicious cycle. He wasn't that guy that everybody saw covered in tattoos behind bars. There was another side to Steve. You just had to get to know him. He's funny, he's charismatic. Um, he was fun to be around. You enjoyed his company, he had something to offer in a conversation. And finally, in 2013, thanks to treatment, inner strength, or both, Stephen Neeson got that opportunity to prove himself. He was granted parole, sent to a halfway house in Brantford, Ontario, with a job nearby. If he could stay clean and go straight for just a year and a half, he would get his official release, free and clear of the criminal justice system at last. Forensic psychiatrist John Bradford has looked into the eyes of Paul Bernardo and Russell Williams, and he thought Stephen Neeson had a fighting chance. Um, but you got the feeling, when I read the material on him, that there was some hope there, that he wasn't this completely damaged soul, that something could happen with the right mix of, of intervention. And on September the 18th, 2013, something did happen, but it wasn't right. At a local bank of Montreal, security cameras captured this man in disguise strolling into the branch. He gave the teller a note saying he had a gun and demanding cash, then escaped in a minivan. But within minutes, the van was wrapped around a lamppost in Brantford, and two suspects were under arrest. One identified as Stephen Neeson. I was shocked. I was really shocked. I thought that um, he was making a change 
I think he got to a stage in his life that he didn't know what other choices there were. Like he just followed the same path that he always did because it's what he knew. Scott Fraser arrested Neeson over a decade ago and told us then what he thought about his chances. In five years or eight years or 10 years when he gets out, you and I may be sitting here to talk about why he's done it again. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Fraser is now the Brockville because police like chief. Said, at the end of the day, catching bad guys can be easy, putting them away can be easy, but maybe one time you'd like to see that person who's actually told you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do well, and they do well. So we always have that little bit of hope, but there's always, you know, prevailing life of crime, generally for them when they come out. But Stephen Neeson would never have to make that choice about going straight again. In February 2015, awaiting trial for the bank robbery, he was found dead at the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center, drug paraphernalia in his cell. Was it accidental? Suicide? A jailhouse murder? No cause of death has yet been determined. For now, the last unanswered question in the life of Stephen Neeson. I know in my heart Steve would never commit suicide. I don't ever believe that he would ever do that. So I don't know what happened. The coroner doesn't know what happened. Now it's gone to toxicology. And I'm worried that we'll never know and his life will have gone and there'll be no answers again, like when his life started.